All right, this is a re re recording of the lecture from November 27th. Um, this will be an abbreviated lecture, likely not covering every single uh, little detail that we talked about in class here, simply because this is my third time recording it. All right, we're going to talk about that age old question of where do we come from? Right, and there are many ideas that existed throughout history. So there were ideas based on religions like the Adam and Eve creation story or in the indigenous cultures, um, the creation story involving Turtle Island. Different philosophers have tried to come up with an answer to this question. And finally, science has also attempted to answer that question as well. We're going to focus on the science aspect because this is a science class. Right. And so when we're thinking about science and kind of that progression to the thought of the history or of the theory of evolution here, we have to recognize um, that science is relying on empirical thought. So empirical thought are observations to form an idea and a hypothesis, right, that we're relying on what we are seeing rather than something that's non-physical or a spiritual point of view, right? So we're looking at what we're seeing. We're looking at the data. In the 1600s, there tended to be a shift towards more of an empirical thought, right? And this is what influenced Darwin when he came up with the theory of evolution. We're going to talk a lot about Darwin today and his influences behind how he came to this theory. So Charles Darwin wrote the uh, book on the origin of species by means of natural selection, right? And that led to successfully after he proposed this theory and many other observations and hypotheses were tested, this modern definition of evolution, that evolution is a change in allele frequency in a population over time, right? So we're relating back kind of like the genetics component of uh, species into this definition of evolution. So if we set the stage for Darwin's ideas, right, in the 1700s, there are some scientists that started to challenge the idea that life forms were fixed and unchanging, right? George Buffon was one of these. He said that populations of living things can change over time, which was a novel idea at the time. But we don't hear of George Buffon because he hid his ideas in a 44 volume series of books. So not really accessible for the general public. Another individual was John Baptiste Lamarck, and he proposed that life on Earth evolves. However, his proposal was that um, a species are adapting to their environment by the use and disuse of body parts. Right, so this would be the inheritance of acquired characteristics idea that it's behaviors changing and modifying traits and then those traits are inherited by the offspring. So a good example of this is giraffes. Right? Giraffes might have started off with a neck similar to a horse. Right? They had to stretch their neck in order to reach the leaves on the tops of the trees. They pass the stretched neck down to their offspring. Their offspring stretch their necks even further and pass that um, trait down to their offspring as well. All right, so it's the use and disuse of their necks that led to the evolution of giraffes, which is what Lamarck was proposing. All right now, at the same time, all right, there are some hypotheses about geological processes in the early 19th century, one of which was catastrophism, which suggested the Earth was just 6,000 years old and it's these large catastrophic events that changed its geological structure, right? So we're talking about large meteors hitting the earth or super volcanoes exploding. This is different from what these two individuals proposed, James Hunton and Charles Lyell. They proposed the uniformitarianism hypothesis from geology, right? That it wasn't these catastrophic events, but rather these really slow, geological processes that led to this substantial substantial change right and so using this idea right, it was hypothesized that the earth was much older than 6,000 years old great example of this is the um, 
and Grand Canyon in the United States here. We have this river that over many, 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 many years carved out this canyon through erosion processes. Now, Darwin, when he was 22, he started a voyage around the world on the HMS Beetle, right? This HMS Beagle voyage took five years, right? And he was only 22. But of everything that he saw throughout his voyages, right, he started to amass this collection of observations that really influenced his ideas. So on Darwin's voyage, he collected thousands of plants and animals and fossils, right? And he really literally uh, circumnavigated the globe here. Right, so he went all over the place. When we look at some of his um, collections and we look at fossils, he noticed that the fossils that he found on the mainland South America looked really similar to present day species. Right, so this is a giant ground sloth and he noticed that while different, it looked really similar to the modern day sloth. Right, it looked very dissimilar from individuals on other continents. Right, so because he found it in South America, he noticed that it looked really close to South American species that were still alive. He also looked at um, many different plants and animals along his journeys. One of those um, animals that really influenced his observations were the Galapagos Island finches. And he noticed that these finches had these really distinctive traits that allowed them to better exploit their environment. For example, some of their beaks were thicker and meant for crushing of their food. Some of them were used for grasping objects in order to look for their food. And some of their beaks were really, really long and thin and meant to probe in flowers or maybe decaying matter in order to find their food. All right, so it was these distinctive traits that allowed them to better exploit their environment. So many of his observations um, that were influential to him came from the Galapagos Island, right? these islands off the coast of South America. He noticed that many organisms were similar to the mainland. So for example, he saw the Galapagos turtles, right? He recognized it as a turtle, right? There are turtles on the mainland, but it was different. It was a distinct, different type of turtle. Same with the iguanas. He also noticed that the islands had species different from other islands surrounding them. So in this image here, we see that every island has a bird, but the birds are very distinct from one another. All right. So Doran, after all his journeys and his studies and his observations, concluded that the Earth is very old and it is constantly changing. All right. And this supported, geologically, the idea of uniformitarianism. All right where these natural forces are gradually changing the earth, right? So for example, the erosion of canyons, we have that lateral erosion and that vertical erosion. Same with the formation of mountains when two continental plates come together and we have upward thrust to create these mountains. And these ideas are still operating today and we can still see them in action. So Darwin's theories, right, after he arrived back after his vert, uh, voyage, he began to write a book explaining his ideas, but he was not the only one that had these ideas. So for example, Alfred Wallace, right, was a gentleman that also had the same ideas. He actually sent Darwin some of his unpublished manuscripts proposing the same ideas, and Darwin and Wallace's papers were published together. Well, Darwin went on to write the book on the origin of species, right, which um, became a very popular book and kind of thrust his name into um, the history of what we know about biology and our understanding of biology. But it also started a great debate concerning evolution. So in Darwin's book, he proposed um, that present day species arose from a succession of ancestors and that we see this descent with modification. Right. So as descendants of an individual move to a new environment, right, they adapted modifications that help them better fit into that new environment. So in class, we went over the difference between Darwin and Lamarck's theory. You can pause this video now if you would like. We came to the answer that um, 
Darwin proposed a theory of evolution based on influences from their environment. All right, so it's the environment that caused these different traits to evolve. Whereas Lamarck proposed that it was the use and disuse of body parts, right, or behavioral changes. So Darwin proposed this idea of natural selection, right, descent with modification. And so natural selection really states that it's the environment, right, that is doing the selecting upon the species. And so when we talk about natural selection, there are four criteria that have to be met. First, more offspring have to be produced that can survive. So there's overproduction. There has to be some phenotypic variation, right? So variation has to exist and it has to show up. So it's a phenotypic variation rather than a genotypic variation, which could lead to a phenotypic variation, right? But the variation exists. There is a difference in fitness associated with that natural selection. Right, so fitness is uh, basically a measure of the offspring that survive and make more offspring themselves. Uh, so in theory, the more offspring you produce, the higher your fitness. We can see that the light colored snails in our example here are not doing as well as the darker colored snails. So there's a difference in fitness. And finally, these traits have to be heritable. And we see that in the case down here where our brown snails are giving rise to more brown snails and our lighter colored snails are giving more rise to lighter colored snails. So those four criteria have to be met. In class, we did this class review here, right? I'm not gonna go over the details again, um, but if we're looking at these uh, populations, we see that that first one is violating those criteria by not having any variation. That second population, there's variation, but it's not being inherited by the offspring. And in that last example here, we don't have enough offspring produced. There's not an um, overproduction. So what is a population? Might seem straightforward, right? But I want to make sure we're all on the same page with the biological definition of a population. And that is a subset of individuals of one species, right? So it's not all the individuals of a singular species, but a subset of that species. Right, just a, a smaller number of those species that occupies a particular geographic area and can reproduce. All right, we're gonna use Joshua trees as our example. And so this would be an individual Joshua tree. And when we see many Joshua trees inhabiting the same geographic area, we can assume that they're reproducing with each other. This would be a population. We can show that population uh, in a map version. And in fact, if you look at what looks like a singular pop population in this image and zoom in on it, we see that it's actually many distinct populations, right? Because we see that they're geographically, uh, there are populations that are not overlapping with one another. All right, some key points when we think about natural selection and evolution in general, right? Individuals do not evolve, right? It's the populations that evolve. Evolution takes many successive generations. Therefore, you cannot see evolution in one individual. It's only gonna work with heritable traits, right? So you may have to be able to pass these traits to the offspring. And lastly, but more, most importantly here, is that there is no goal, right? So these individuals did not come together and decide that in 100 years, they were going to develop wings, right? They did not set a goal. It just happens and it's random and it's influenced by uh, the environment, All right? So there's no goal. And so we talked about natural selection as a mechanism of evolution, All right? And that's really what Charles Darwin proposed. We'll see that there's other me mechanisms of evolution out there. But let's look at some of the evidence that Charles Darwin used and that modern researchers have used as evidence for evolution as a whole. So we can look at paleontology, right? So the fossil record. And we can see from the fossil record, depending on where they are deposited in rock layers, we can determine um, the progression of a biological community over time. So for example, in older rock layers, you'll see older fossils. In younger rock layers, you'll see younger fossils. Right? And we can use this concept when we're trying to look for these transitional species, 
right? So they are fossils that link extinct species with other species, whether those species are living today, right? Or whether those species lived in the past. So an idea or an example of this would be the evolution of tetrapods. We can see that they're now both extinct species. They lived millions of years ago. The fish lived earlier than this amphibian. Oops, excuse me. Than this amphibian here, right? But we see there's this species in between that have traits similar to a fish, like scales and fins, and also similar to this amphibian with a flat head with eyes on top and a neck, right? So the species have traits from both of those individuals. We would say this is a transitional species. It's linking these individuals together in their evolutionary history. If we look at biogeography, all right, so that's simply looking at the geographic distribution of organisms, right? And so if you looked at a map and you see where these organisms are existing, right? This is also going to have some evidence for evolution, all right? We see that isolated continents and island groups tend to have evolved their own distinct plant and animal communities, right? And when we find animal or um, plant communities that are only found in a particular location, we would say that those are endemic species, right? So these endemic species are only found in that area, right? And if we look at the distribution of organisms, we see that isolated continents and island groups tend to have more endemic species uh, than larger areas or mainlands. Convergent evolution is also um, providing some evidence for evolution here. And it's showing how different species that are not related, so they're from different lineages, show similar characteristics because they occupy similar environments. So an example of this might be a shark, an ichthyothor, and a dolphin. Right, so there's a fish, it's a reptile, and it's a mammal. They're not related. But if we look at them, they show these similar characteristics. They all have fins. They have this common body shape that allow them to adapt to living in this aquatic environment. Right? So we would call these similar characteristics analogous features. And we would often see these analogous features. Again, they're not related, um, but we would often use these um, when looking at many of different types of species. So we use the fins and the body shape for these aquatic species, but on land with plants, roots or aerial roots, so roots that are above ground that are used to climb um, objects or climb supports can be another analogous feature. We see that the aerial roots of this English ivy and the winter creeper uh, look like each other. In class, we talked about other examples of convergent evolution, such as wings and sonar, right? There are two great um, examples there. I would encourage you to look up some more um, examples of convergent evolution. There are many out there. All right, another evidence for evolution is selective breeding, right? Well, this does not happen naturally, right? This is an artificial selection. So it's breeders choosing the parents or humans are choosing the parents. It's not nature, right? This is still evidence for evolution because even though we're doing the selecting, right? We're doing the selecting in a way that really chooses for desirable phenotypes and certain alleles, right? So in a way, it's a form of selection in that we are choosing what traits we want to see persist in the population. But in natural selection, the same idea persists, that it's the environment that really chooses what phenotypes and alleles will persist in that population. And Darwin could see this when he was alive and doing all of his observations, that there's already a lot of evidence from artificial selection. This has been happening for many years. So pigeons were artificially selected and bred for different colors and different traits. Right? This wild mustard plant was artificially bred and over time led to all these different varieties of vegetables. The last piece of evidence we will talk about are homologies. So homologies 
are a fundamental similarity due to descent from a common ancestor. And there are three different types of homologies that we will talk about. Those are anatomical, developmental, and molecular. So anatomical, we're talking about physical structures that look similar, right? So these structures are derived from a common ancestor. Good example of this would be the human arm as well as the turtle uh, arm, the bat wing, and a whale fin. If we look at the bone structures, we see that they're fairly similar across all different species. We can also look at these vestigial structures, right? So these are anatomical structures that have no apparent function, but resemble structures of presumed ancestors. So if we look at ourselves, for example, we have the coccyx bone, right? This coccyx bone has no apparent function, right? But rather is a remnant of what could have been an ancestral tail that we don't have anymore. So right now it has no apparent function, but in the past it did. We can see these on other animals as well. One example of this would be a boa constrictor, um, where we actually see skeletal remains of a hip and hind leg bones. Well, snakes don't have legs, so why would they have hind leg bones? So it's a vestigial structure because it has no apparent function, right? But it is resembling maybe the structures of one of the ancestors of this boa constrictor. We can look at developmental homology, right? So when we're looking at these types of homologies, we're looking at similars, or similarities that are taking place during embryonic stages of development for different species. And if we look at a chick, a human, and a house cat, we see that they have these homologies of having a gill pouch and a tail. So we see that humans have gill ridges in their embryos, right? Same with the chicks and the house cat, indicating that we all evolved from some aquatic animal with gills. And these individuals also have these tails, right? And in humans, we don't have tails anymore, right? But because we have it in our embryonic stage, it suggests um, that our ancestors also had a tail at some point. The last homology we will talk about is genetic homology. And this is where we are directly looking at DNA and amino acid sequences between different organisms. All right, so we're looking at the genetic code now, which Darwin didn't have in his day, but we have it now. And because we have it, we are starting to see the similarities between species. All right, well, first of all, we all have DNA, right? We all have amino acid sequences. So that suggests that all life forms are related because we share this common genetic code. We can also see that depending on how similar our genetic code is to another species, we can determine how related we are evolutionarily, all right? So if we look at um, this image up to the side here, we see that we're looking at this very specific gene for this hemoglobin beta chain, and we're looking to see the similarities and the differences in amino acid structures. Now this rhesus monkey, Right? we're actually really similar to. There's 138 similar amino acids. Right? Um, so we're, we're pretty closely related to a rhesus monkey, evolutionarily speaking. But if we look at a fish, we see that there's still some homologies. There are 21 amino acids that are similar. Right? But that's not a, a huge similarity. Right? There's actually more differences than similarities, indicating that evolutionarily, we are very distantly related to fish, right? Another example is are in these uh, genes between the human and the fruit fly here. Aniridia is the um, loss of an iris in human, an eyeless gene in the fruit fly. And we see that between these two genes, they're actually 90% similar, right? So there's a lot of these genetic homologies. All right, I would encourage you to answer this question on your own here. Otherwise, that is the end of this lecture.